Did you want a picture of me too? <laughs> yes, let's get Carr here. <laughs> Selling a little crack there. <laughs> um, um, it means a different thing here. When you say on the crack here or having a crack, that means you're having fun, I think. Right? Yeah. Um, the, um, a lot of people in this audience would like to be you. You guys have businesses that are up and going. Um, some foolish people have probably backed you and given you money. Um, some guy named Jeff is working with you. Uh, Bezos or, Be yeah, that's what it is. Um, so it's the good part, right? It's the easy part. You finally made it. Well, I, I should say, if anyone wants to be me, thank you. That is a big change from several years ago, um, 10 years ago especially, but um, even more recently, seven years ago when we started, nobody was interested in content, nobody wanted to have anything to do with it, everyone said digital needle will never work, so forth. Fortunately, we were able to scrape out a living for a few years and along with Jim and others have, we think, figured out the model, future model for journalism and digital. Business Insider is now about 60 million uniques worldwide, tens of millions of dollars of revenue and should actually be nicely profitable this quarter. Not full year, but this quarter. You've been and we saying think we figured that a couple out. of years. Going to be profitable next quarter. We know we are profitable this, <laughs> this quarter. quarter. We don't have to say okay. next quarter. It's the fourth quarter. So we're all profitable. Uh, so, we're definitely not done. We have a long way to go, and the challenge is to just get better every day. That's what we've been trying to do from the beginning. Yeah, and I think for us, um, you know, Vox Media, those of you who don't know it, we run The Verge, SB Nation, Vox.com, Racked Eater, Curb, Polygon. Um, our challenge, yes, we've grown in you know, well over 150 million uniques, et cetera, but we've, we've proven that we can grow great big websites. The next phase to your question is, can we grow important media brands? And we think we're on our way, but we know we have a lot of work to do. And it's a flip from, okay, great, you can, you can create some quality work, you can get attention, and now let's build some sustainable media brands. That means not just on our dot-coms, that means on other platforms, whether it's Facebook, <coughs> YouTube, Twitter, or television, or otherwise. Well, when you talk about other platforms, what I worry about is that you guys will end up just being kind of a feeder service for those platforms over and over, that, 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 that you're going to end up as, as everything goes mobile, and Facebook in the U.S. at least sort of owns mobile, um, that you're going to end up just a, kind of an adjacency to their business. Platforms over publishers, it's something that we talk a lot about in the States. Yeah, I, you know, at, at Vox Media, we're, we're a platform and a publisher. We have a platform called Chorus, which enables our creative people and our advertisers to, to do well. That's how we've been able to scale the company. Yet, we also recognize that you can't be an island onto yourself. So we work with all these platforms. And I've read your column on Facebook as a good thing for video, certainly, you know, some uh, YouTube is, is the huge video platform. If Facebook really leans into video, perhaps there's more balance there. And as there become more distribution outlets, that's more opportunity for us to build brand. If there isn't an economic proposition, ultimately, for companies like ours or for companies like the New York Times or Business Insider, then ultimately they're not going to work. Those platforms aren't going to work. So there has to be a consumer proposition. There has to be a business proposition for the partner. But the more that there is, the more opportunity there is for strong media brands to survive and, and thrive. Henry, you and I talked about this, and you made it clear you see Facebook as a friend. That they're Absolutely. Facebook is an incredible source of distribution, along with Twitter, along with, for us, LinkedIn. I'm sure for Jim and more consumer brands. We've got many other big social networks. Google is still very important. There are a lot of people running around saying, it's just all social. Google's irrelevant now. It's not true. People look for stuff. And there is also a big myth going around that has been perpetrated by your fine publication, which is a great publication, that Thank home, you, Henry. home pages are dying. Maybe bad home pages are dying. Good home pages are doing quite well, and so that's another source of, of distribution. So the way we look at it is ultimately somebody has to tell the stories, and but we are we, happy to be the one telling the stories. You mean people step up and go, hmm, what am I going to do? Businessinsider.com. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, time. as a matter of fact, they do, and I think they certainly do it with the New York Times, and they do it with The Verge and with Vox, 
And, and the reason they do it is because they have an affinity to the brand. They, they discover it, they may prefer, they discover it on search, and if they like it, we get them as a customer coming back. And they, might, they may prefer to navigate to us via Twitter or via Facebook, but more and more, if they like what they see, they come back, and that's called brand building. And I think you hear a lot about the death of the homepage from companies that are trying to game the algorithms, from companies that have tried to, say, spam Google or spam Facebook. What happens is those platforms change the algorithm so that they can't be spam. Because if you're running Google, if you're running on Facebook, yeah, you don't want if, crap if, on your if, feed. If your user base tips more than 50% over into mobile, what does really a homepage mean? What does a homepage look like on mobile? It, it, I mean, you can, it's more of a stream you know, for yeah. us right now. And, but I think the point is whether it's a homepage or whether you're following us on Twitter or whether you're, <laughs> you know, you're following us on Facebook, you've indicated an affinity for the brand. It's content that you want to consume and engage with as opposed to a random, where did this come from, where did I land? And that's the distinction, I think. And, you know? and this is an incredibly important part about digital media in general, is traditional publications, the whole idea when we started, people said, you've got to figure out how to imprison your readers on your site. Don't let them go. You got them there, hold them there. Turns out it's a terrible idea. And if you look at Google, Google made its entire business out of giving you a link that you like and sending you elsewhere and you come back. So the whole idea is really the internet is the publication. We all read multiple publications all the time. If you want to follow us on Twitter, follow us on LinkedIn, follow us on Facebook, that's great. Wherever you want to follow us, Fabulous. Come to the homepage. Hey, but we Henry, hope we can are you make it confident for you. that you're going to be able to like, like get something out of their pocket when they're just stopping by for a second? Absolutely. We're happy to have Thank you for reading. If you come, we will probably show you an advertisement or two. That's how we bring you the content. We also <laughs> sell you a professional subscription service if you're very interested in an industry niche, like digital media or payments. Great service for that. No advertisements there. But yes, we're happy to have anybody stop by. And if you want to read one story a month, that's fine. If you want to read 15 a day, also thank you. We want to serve both types of reader. Um, we're in a room full of entrepreneurs, which is where it means we're in a room full of ideas. This room is brimming with ideas. Um, there's two scarcities that confront ideas. One is a scarcity of attention. We, John and I talked about this yesterday. How do you get noticed? And then there's the scarcity of capital. In New York, there doesn't seem to be that much scarcity of capital. There's a lot of money chasing a lot of content. As you point out a couple of years ago, you couldn't get arrested. Now everyone loves you. But sometimes capital creates its own challenges. I think of Pierre Omidyar at First Look Media, which after Jeff Bezos, spent 250 million bucks on the Washington Post. He said, I'm gonna start a media company from scratch with a quarter of a billion dollars. And it's just like, wow, that's amazing. And you know what? They've, they've had significant trouble, especially in the past couple of weeks. Departures of talent. M they're more about making news than they are about making news. So he here's a point to make about capital, is it has only really been the last couple of years that digital media has started to see the kind of capital investments that are just the price of entry in starting a magazine or starting a newspaper. You wanted to start a magazine 15 years ago, you needed $25 million, you were gonna lose money for seven years, maybe you come through, start a cable network, please just start with 500 million for starters. Now, finally, as everybody has realized, digital media is the future. It is a viable business. It's only going to get bigger over the next 10 to 20 years. You're starting to see major investments. Jim has gone out and raised a ton of money. We've been significantly backed as well. But it's only now that you're starting to see real investments made in well, digital. Let, let's, talk, let, let's talk about why. Um, there's some changes afoot. One change is a demographic change, and there are new brands that are being adopted by a new demographic, a demographic that is young and grew up with digital, that prefers to consume via digital and confers, prefers to consume brands that are natively digital, with talent that is natively digital. That's one thing. The second thing is the monop internet has changed the built-in monopolies that, say, radio towers, television towers, and printing presses had, and so that's level things. And if you're a cable network now, you're looking around and saying, wow, maybe I'm next. That's the one left 
one less scarce distribution thing that's left. Um, and that started on Bundle. We saw HBO un have its announcement saying it's going to be available a la carte. Well, what does that mean if you're running a cable network? Does that mean that you're going to be on the same playing field as a big YouTube channel or, or a big brand like Business Insider if you're a competitor of theirs? So you know, things are changing. That is leading capital to wake up and say, like, wow, OK. These do have big opportunities to be the next media company. Yeah, but I, I sometimes wonder what is, the, and some of the money is smart, some of it is dumb. Um, uh, I wonder, like you guys are building better and better media products, and I consume both your media products and count myself as both a customer and a fan. Um, and you've done a good job when you, when you make investments. I think you've made smart ones. But as you pile up, uniques as you pile up impressions and CPMs the advertising just continues to drop 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 I wonder if you're ever you're in a mass game right or maybe not um, and and so you just climb 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 meanwhile what you're chasing is a less and less dear prize so so let me go back to the first thing your question about can too much capital ruin you right. if we had had a boatload of capital when we started we never would have gotten anywhere. Because actually working on a shoestring does force you to figure out how the medium works, figure out what people love, how to build the distribution. I know you learn with very small sites. And so we do see some companies it, now that are it helps you on taking, the cost side. If it's going on your credit you have, card, you, you're going to be pretty You careful. have to figure out how to make it work. And it's, so it's a very good discipline. But in terms of advertising, there is a huge pool of advertising spending. And one thing that's happening in the market right now is this move to programmatic, which is great for advertisers and it is great for media companies that have a cost structure that can work with programmatic. We work with a lot of our clients on programmatic. It's a huge advantage for them. It removes a lot of hassle for us. We're not trying to protect prices that are the old ana analog of print prices. So the model works for us. Definitely creates headaches for the older companies, though. And then the other thing that's going on the advertising side is a huge growth of native content. BuzzFeed has made a killing on this. And to their full credit, they basically invented this new model that huge dollars are now going into. And I know Jim does this as well. We do it in the business and tech space. And so this is a huge new opportunity. It's much more creative. It's really unleashing the new innovation around brand advertising, which after Google sucked all the oxygen out of the room for 15 years, we didn't have any innovation. Now we're starting to see real innovation on the creative side, which is great. Yeah, we're, we're actually seeing CPMs going up. And I'm not disputing that maybe as an industry-wide trend they're going down to flat. Um, I think programmatic actually, in a, in a funny way, is raising the floor. Um, and I think if you can deliver. Explain that. I don't, because um, you've got machines bidding. I mean, what it's doing is taking inefficiency yes, out of the system, exactly, right? That's right. And we used to have a name for that inefficiency. It was called profit, right? You used to. The right. New York Times. Right. It, yeah. You know, I, I think it does, it, what, what we've seen is that Pre, you know, premium audiences define however the advertiser defines it, which, you know, context does play a role, audience composition does play a role. You're right, the efficient pricing will happen, and sometimes that's good for the publisher that can actually deliver what the advertisers want. In addition to that, um, storytelling, native, if you want to call it that, branded content, content marketing, a lot of different words for it, uh, is here and it's growing. And what we're finding is that marketers want to act like publishers in the sense that they need to build brand, they need to tell a story, they need to create a mythology around their products. How do they do that? They do that by creating content and making sure that content finds its audience. What do we do well? That's what we do well. We create content efficiently and we help it find its audience. In, in our case at Vox Media, our platform actually is now going to be available to marketers who want to use it to tell stories and find their audiences. So we can use our technology, we can use the processes that we've developed that have helped us become big media companies. We can now apply that to marketers that are looking to do the same thing. A couple of years ago I noticed, I mean historically recruitment at the New York Times involved people would stop by, Mother Times would open up the kimono a little bit, people would jump in our lap, and we would own them. And we've had a more difficult time in terms of recruiting, where people come in, they look around, and they might opt for maybe a more frictionless CMS like yours, 
a more direct relationship with the audience like yours. And so we've gotten picked off, and we've, we've lost people we cared about. We haven't been able to get uh, people that, that we wanted. But now it's your turn. I've noticed now uh, Joe Wiesenthal, who is such, such a, did, did such an amazing job for you, and, and Josh Taplowski at, at your side. Now you guys are the ones getting picked off. How does it feel? <laughs> We're happy. We're happy that traditional media companies with boatloads of money and all the power are finally recognizing the incredible talent in these digital organizations. You're by a the little way, sad, though. It is You're very difficult. So a couple of key points. Digital is as different from print and television as print and television are from each other. And folks are finally beginning to realize that. And on the journalism side, from our perspective, this is a golden age for journalism and media. And it's an incredibly exciting time to be a young journalist coming in. When we used to interview people five years ago, you would see them say, or seven years ago, you see them say, well, I'll work for you for six months before I get a real job at a real publication. Unpaid now, internships. Yeah, now people come in, they're just so excited to be in digital. There's so much more of a canvas you can work with. You don't have to work with, it's just a 600 word article subject to a publishing deadline. And by the way, that great section that you worked so hard on gets cut because there's no room for it. You can't use pictures or video. You make people it sound love. so horrible. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like it. I, there, there, will, there will be talent flows in and out. We were you know, lucky enough to be able to bring in Ezra Klein and Melissa Bell and Matt Iglesias to start Vox.com. We have Neelai Patel and Amanda Clute, all sorts of great people. And I, you know, we're, I, I think we're a net benefit of the flow of, a net beneficiary of the flow of uh, talent. And I think it's in part because not only does talent deserve to be paid really well, but more over, I think they want to be successful. They want to go to a place that, where they know they can be heard, where they can build something lasting, something where they'll get noticed, and something that's good. And so it's not just about who can finance the paycheck, it's about who can provide an audience, an infrastructure, and a truly digital approach to things that will make them successful. And a wonderful environment. And I should say, it's the same with, with Jim's many brands, but we have an incredibly talented newsroom. We've got 100 journalists. There, many of them are just in, incredibly good, and if we couldn't lose people, the model wouldn't work. And, and you can lose people too. David, there are 1,200 excellent journalists at the Times. You're going to be fine. Right? I wonder if um, I'm old enough, so I moved to New York in 2000 for Inside.com, which was a media and technology convergence site. Really good idea. Probably not great to launch it before broadband, but. Um, so we mowed through 25 million bucks, and then it went kablooey, and there was no, there, 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 there was a bubble, and the bubble went away, and the access to ready capital went away. I've, I've been watching in New York, and I kind of, it seems like, seems sort of bubbly to me. It seems like we might, um, that at some point, uh, uh, some of this capital is going to get burned and people are going to take it off the table. Uh, you know, things have changed since the glory days of inside.com. You know, there's, uh, there, there's, everyone is carrying, everyone, I'm going to borrow your phone. Yeah. We all are consuming media all of the time. Um, you know, that's one big thing that's changed. It used to be for those of us who were fortunate enough to be behind a desk with dial-up access, uh, we would consume media for half an hour a day. And then broadband came, and then those of us who were behind a desk consumed it longer. And then mobile came, and now all of us, whether we have a desk job or a job outside, we have access, and we have access 24 hours a day, whether or not, you know, regardless of what we're doing. So there's just a ton more consumption. That creates a whole lot more economic opportunity. The, access to distribution via Google, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. We can now <laughs> launch a media brand, and if our work is good, if it's quality, we can find an audience. So things have changed, and capital has acknowledged that. And of course, not everyone is going to be successful, but there's a reason why more capital is flowing in. I think it's a positive. Some will get burned. Some will make a whole lot of money. Agree 100% on digital media. I will say, <laughs> I agree with you that we are coming to probably toward a peak of a tech cycle. <coughs> Not like the 1990s. That was quite unique, having lived through it. I hope unique. 
but tech you, has you always been very part of it. Yes, I know. Tech has always been cyclical. You saw many prominent venture capitalists almost on cue together come out this summer and start suddenly warning about the fact that capital is going to dry up. At some point it will, and venture capitals will retrench, and the same people who were urging you to spend, 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 it's all about market share and users, will suddenly say, oh no, we are about profit. You must cut your burn rate and become profitable. It'll be an amazing change. It'll blow your mind. These are the same people who are just telling me to spend their money. It will happen at some point. Don't know when, it's, but at some point. It's a trope of, of business um, of, uh, when, when you're on a panel with people who built successful businesses in a room full of people who are looking for, uh, you know, best learnings to say, you know, what's one thing they need to do? I wonder if you can think of one thing that if you were talking to someone here who's young guy that they most definitely should not do, never do, don't do. Maybe capital is pulling you a certain way, or maybe your employees are pulling you a certain way. Or you know, I, I find a, think of a few things. One thing, it sounds obvious, <laughs> but uh, don't be a copycat. Um, and and I say that not for actually not for any ethical reason. I say that because you won't succeed if you're There is chasing, so much me too. If you're chasing someone else's idea, you're not really an entrepreneur. Why bother? Um, why not just join that company? That's one thing. I think another thing is, and this is going to sound a little lofty, don't, don't sacrifice um, culture. Uh, you know, when I, when I was starting out, I, I probably didn't think about it enough, but we were creating a culture uh, around Vox Media, one that believes in talent and believes in technology. Um, and that culture now runs the company. I don't run the company. So think really hard about the culture that you're creating. And it, if you're busy trying to raise money and try to get a product to market, like you're like, culture, fuck that, I just need to do something. But it, it, as you grow, you will figure out that that's really what dominates your business. What's on your things not to do list? Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Wow. Well, I <laughs> <laughs> I'll phrase it as a positive, not a negative. Of course you will. Focus 100% on your, your re in our case, readers, but in your case, users in a lot of cases, and your team. To Jim's point about culture, you've got to have great people. You've got to make them incredibly passionate about the mission. Otherwise, you have no chance of succeeding. And if you ever take your eyes off whether you're creating a great service for the folks who are consuming it, to say, go suck up to investors or spend too much time doing things that are away from that, you're asking for trouble. Gentlemen, I think our work is done here. You've been a great audience. You've been great panelists. Thanks a million. See Thank you, you very much. much.